God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power that is here so tangibly already. God, for this wonderful worship team that leads us into your throne room week in and week out. God, we thank you for the encounters that have already been had. But Lord, I just know today that you've got so many more things just ready to pour out into people's lives. Lord, encounters that are still ready, waiting to have in these next few minutes that we have together. God, I know that there are words that you want to speak into people's hearts. Lord, some of them are going to come from my lips, but they're going to be your words. Lord, others of them are going to be simply you speaking into people's heart. But Lord, we thank you today for however your word comes. Lord, we thank you for your word that never returns void. That always accomplishes that for which it was sent. God, we thank You. Lord, I couldn't possibly know the situations and circumstances people find themselves in the midst of today. But Lord, You know. Lord, You see the greatest need. You see the smallest care. And God, I thank You today that as Your Word goes forth, Lord, You're going to speak into each and every one of our hearts. God, we don't want to walk out of here the same way we walked in. But Lord, right now we open up our heart, our mind to come and change us, shape us, mould us. Lord, make us more like You before we walk out of here today. God, we thank You for Your Spirit of wisdom and revelation resting upon each and every one of our hearts. And we thank You with great anticipation for the Word. And someone with faith shouted, Amen. Amen. Come on, why don't you be seated? As you do that, why don't you high five your neighbour next to you? Come on, say, get ready, get ready. Get ready, get ready. God wants to speak to you today. And uh, you can just stay right there on the keys. Come on, man. Yeah, just keep going for a moment. I'm a musician, so I have a theology that God's not moving if the music's not playing. It's not at all biblical, but I just like it. But uh, I want to share today around the thought a partnership. Somebody shout partnership. I want to talk about the thought partnership. I was out praying earlier this year and in the first week of this year and I was just reading out of the Scripture. The very first book that I turned to this year was 1 Corinthians. And right out, right out of chapter 1 there, in 1 Corinthians, as I was reading, it just leapt off the page. It says from verse 7, it says, Now you have every spiritual gift you need. That's great. You have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly await for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you'll be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this for He is faithful. Come on somebody, we serve a God who is faithful. He is faithful to do what He says and check this out. He has invited you into partnership with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The invitation into partnership that God has for us is not just an invitation into a partnership with a good idea. It's not just into partnership with a good message, although that's a good message. It's not just into partnership with a great vision, although there's great vision. God's invited us into the greatest partnership of all. Partnership with His Son, Jesus Christ. It's the greatest partnership we could ever imagine. Now you see, God could have created the world any old way He wanted to. He could have created an existence where He just shows up in our life every day and does miracles and we get to stand back and watch. That would be entertaining. That would be more entertaining than game seven in 36 minutes. Don't worry, I know what's happening. That would be an entertaining existence, but that's not the world God created. God created a world where He chooses to partner with us. I certainly don't understand why when I lay my little old hand upon a sick person, they get healed. There's certainly nothing special about this hand, trust me. It's the power of partnership with the miracle working power of the Holy Spirit that as I join my faith with His power, all of a sudden He begins to do what only He can do. This is the partnership God has invited us into. I want to share a story with you before we get going into our message today. We run a conference every year. It's called Planet Shakers Conference. It was at this event 16 and a half years ago on January the 14th, the year 2000, that I gave my heart to God. It was at this conference that Pastor Rich was preaching and I first encountered his ministry. We've been running Planet Shakers Conference every year since then. We since started a church. We started our church in 2004. Now, six to 12 years later, it's a church of 13 and a half thousand members. In 12 years, it's the fastest growing church in the history of our nation. God's done incredible things. It's been a privilege for me to stand back and first of all, witness it as simply just a young man, a kid fresh out of college. 
And now to be able to play my part as a part of it all. And last year we were there in conference. And one of the things my pastor, Pastor Russell, always felt to do from the very start, it was a youth conference to start with. It was $10 registration when it first started in 1997. Because he felt to teach a generation how to give and not to pay. And so he made the registration $10 and he's always budgeted faith into the budgets. Now I'm sharing things that he shared from stage. It's not a secret. Last year, the budget for our conference was $1.2 million. Just to walk in the doors of the arena that we have it in cost $400,000. That's with no lights, no stage, nothing. Just to walk in the door. It's an expensive city to live in. $1.2 million. We had 6,000 people registered. The rough registration cost to get into the conference was $100. To go to any other Christian conference in Australia, you'd be paying $300. Half the, if you do the math there, 6,000 people registering at $100, that's half the budget covered. Which means our pastor, we, we, we come into conference believing $600,000 is going to come in in offerings. Never once have we had a conference where that hasn't happened. We get to conference last year, the first night was a great night, great move of God. The offering was quite low. The second night, another great move of God, a phenomenal night, but the offering was very low. Came into the third night and we were a long way behind in the red. In the middle of worship, Pastor Russell was there as we were up on stage leading worship and he feels God say, do conference next year for $20. The rough, the average registration price last year was $100. That's cheap. He feels God say, do conference for $20 next year. He puts that thought away. Keeps worshipping. God speaks to him again, do it for $20. He, he introduces the guest preacher. It was Pastor Chris Hill. I believe you all have had him here for food conference before. And uh, let me encourage you, if you're not registered for VU Conference yet, you'll need to do that because God's going to do incredible things there. But we had Chris Hill preaching and he introduces Chris Hill. He walks off stage and then calls all the board members backstage and has an emergency board meeting. And he tells them he feels God's spoken to him. He said, this is how we're feeling. I feel like God's spoken to me $20 next year. However, I know that's a crazy move. You're all the directors of the church. You're all on the board of the church. So it's our necks on the line if this doesn't go down well. But in, in all of my years of serving under Pastor Russell, he's a man who feels God move and feels God speak. But I rarely ever hear him say, God told me. He doesn't use those words as, as a way to get people to do that. He, he doesn't use those words often. And he said, I feel God said. And so that they discussed it. And as they're in the middle of discussing it, he gets a text message with the offering amount from that night. It was another bad offering. So you've got to understand now that there were many hundreds of thousands of dollars behind and they're standing there in the circle, but they felt the presence of God come and each of them said, it doesn't make sense, but we believe you've heard from God and they all voted yes. The next night, coming into the last night of conference, we needed the biggest offering we'd ever had just to cover cost. And the preacher that night, Bishop T.D. Jakes, he was down to do the offering and at the end of his sermon, he did the offering talk. We were in dire straits. We were in, a, we were in a position of need, but we had the bishop doing the offering talk. You know, come on, that, that, that we, we got faith that the bishop can bring it in an offering talk. He gets up, he does his offering talk, 20 seconds. It's like, come on, can't you give it a little bit more? Can't you stir people up a little? Come on, bishop, come on, give it a real offering talk. 20 seconds he does the offering talk for. Takes up an offering. It's the largest single offering in the history of our conference. Covered costs to the dollar that we needed to get through conference that year. But you got to understand the way that that set us up for this year. $20 registrations, that doesn't make any sense. By the end of the last day of conference last year, because it was $20 registrations, over 9,000 people had bought registrations. That right there made it our biggest conference and we were a year before this year. Coming into this year, we actually had to close down registrations. 15,500 people registered. But if you do that math, 15,000 people at $20 a head, that's only 300 grand. The budget was still over a million dollars, which means we were still believing God that, okay, God, you told us to do this at $20 if this is it. We just finished our largest conference we'd ever had, 15,500 people filling an arena in Melbourne that was built for sport, but was filled with the glory of God. First night. Miracle, second night, miracle, third night. By the end of the third night, miraculous offerings. We had already covered the cost of the entire conference such that the last night of conference was a surplus to take us into next year. I'm telling you, 
I love it when we get the opportunity to partner with God. We get to see things that no one's ever seen before. And the miracles that God did this year, it was our biggest conference by double. But it took someone who had faith stepping out and saying, okay, God, if you've called us into partnership, it's scary. It doesn't make sense. But if this is where you've called us to live, there's no place I'd rather be. Come on, somebody. Can someone yell partnership this morning? Come on, yell at me, say partnership. I've got to stop. I've got to stop the keyboard. Otherwise, I'm going to keep telling stories. I want to talk about partnership this morning. I wanted to share that story right at the front because I wanted to stir your faith. You know, the Bible says in Revelations that the enemy is defeated by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. There is power when we testify. Yes, Jesus defeated the enemy, but we get the opportunity to remind Him that He's defeated every time we testify of the goodness of God. And there's power when we come together and say, hey, God did this for me. God did that for me. And what it does in the power of the life of everyone listening is it says, God, do it again. God, if you can do it for them, you can do it for me. So do it again. And there's power in our partnership. God has chosen to invite us into partnership. But what does this partnership mean? It means that in everything God does, He's fully invested, fully committed, full of power and provision. He is the partner that can bring His super to our natural. He can bring His more than to our enough. He's the greatest partner that we could ever imagine. But understand this church, it's not the kind of partnership where God wants us to come in here on a Sunday and have a great encounter and walk out there on a Monday and do life on our own. It's not about us walking out those doors to please God so that when we come back in here next Sunday, we can have a lovely encounter. That's not the partnership He has in mind. It's not even so we can come in here and be filled to go out there and do great works for Him in the week. God wants to walk out those doors with you. God wants to walk out of those doors at the end of this service today into every part of your life, into every hour of the 168 hours until we find ourselves back here next week. God wants to be a partner with you in every area of your life. That means, parents, you're not raising your kids alone. It means you got the greatest partner of all there to raise your kids with you. You may all think that you're a single parent up in here. You're not a single parent. You've got the greatest partner of all. The power of God there to raise your child with you. To teach you how to train up a child. How to fill your house with the presence of God. It means marrying people. We're not, we're not trying to have a marriage together with just our spouse. Trying to work out our problems on our own. Trying to work out how to do this. It means we've got the greatest partner of all right there in the middle of that marriage, making up the cord of three strands that is not easily broken. There's God at the centre of our marriage when we partner with Him. It means business person. You're not in business alone. You've got the greatest business partner of all time inviting you into partnership with Himself. I don't know if you understand what an incredible invitation this is. We, I heard a testimony of a, of a businessman, a great businessman, who, who always invites God into partnership before he steps into any meeting. And he was there one day, he's praying out in the corridor before he walked into a business meeting, just praying for God to be with him, to lead him, to guide him. He's sitting there in the business meeting. He's sitting on one side of the table, all of these business people on the other side of the table. They slide a check across the table to him. He lifts the check up, puts it down. Tries not to smile. It was a large check, quite a few millions of dollars. He feels his business partner, the Holy Spirit, say, don't take the check. He rebukes the devil. <laughs> Rebuke you, devil. That's a silly thing. He feels the Holy Spirit say again, don't, don't take the check. So he slides the check back across the table, stands up, walks out. Three weeks later, finds himself in the same room. He's invited God to come back with him again. Of course, they don't know that, but he knows that. And, and so there he is at the table again, the table between them and the business people on the other side, they slide another check across the table for this business deal. He, he lifts it up, he puts it down. It's, it's many multiples of the first check. What was millions became tens of millions. He feels the Holy Spirit whisper to him, you can take that one. <laughs> That's kind of not fair. It's kind of not fair to walk into a business deal knowing that you've got the power of God there to lead you and to guide you and to direct you. They all don't know that. But for some reason, there you are with the favour and the blessing of God on you. I'm telling you, business people, there's no greater partner to be in business with than God Himself. It means students. 
When you all are studying, you got the greatest study partner of all time. You all didn't know that God wanted another Bachelor of Arts. But if He gets to partner with you, He would love that. You know, we got I, one, of my, one of my roles at, in Melbourne at our church, Planet Shakers, is I run our college ministry. We've got about 2,500 college students part of our church. Probably about 75, 80% of them are Asian. We've got a lot of international students that come from all over the world to come and study in Melbourne. A great predominance of Asian students there. And so I've got a lot of Asian brothers and sisters that have taught me a lot. Like how good Asian food is. <laughs> Woo! Just want to praise God right there. But, but um, we had one of our Asian students there, a gentleman. He, he was in church on a Sunday and had an exam on a Monday. Yeah, that's right. He was here. Let me say that again. Some of you missed that. He was in church on a Sunday and had an exam on a Monday. Oh, you know, that's another sermon. I'll leave that right there. He was in church on a Sunday, but had an exam on the Monday because, you know, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and, and, and all these things. So anyway, that's another sermon. He was there in church on a Sunday with an exam on the Monday, serving in church and went home and he'd been studying all week and he studied late into the night and went to bed and set his alarm, but something didn't work and he slept in. So he woke up on the Monday morning and looked at his watch. He's running late for the exam, freaking out. He's getting dressed. He feels God speak to him and say, it's all good. The exam's delayed. He begins to tell God, God, you don't know what you're talking about. That's stupid. Ex universities do not delay exams. They just don't do that. God said, it's all good. The exam's delayed. So he runs to, runs to the building where the exam is. He rocks up and sure enough, the exam was delayed. So much so they were having some problem with the lights and so much so that he looks at his clock. He's still got 15 minutes to spare. He's like, all right, God, I got 15 minutes. What do I do? He feels God say, study these three things. I mean, he'd studied the whole, he'd revised the whole course, but he feels Holy Spirit to say, just revise these three things. He revised the three, three things quickly, walks into the exam, the entire exam based on those three things. Come on, somebody. God is the greatest partner that you could possibly want to have, whether it's raising your children, whether it's having a marriage, whether it's in your workplace, whether you're studying. God wants to be a part of your life. It's not that He wants another degree. It's that He wants to do it with you. He wants to be a part of your everyday. God has an open invitation into partnership with Him. So Woo, what an invitation. So and He's the greatest partner of all. He doesn't just come to tell us things that no one else can tell us. God's the kind of partner that comes with gifts all the time. That's a good partner. One of my favourite verses in the Bible, book, in, in the book of Proverbs 25 verse 2 says this, It is the glory of God to conceal a manner. It is the glory of kings to search out that manner. Now in that verse, you all got to understand you're the king. Understand Jesus is the king of which means you're a royalty. We're royalty. So it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of kings to search it out. What does that mean? I mean, God's hiding things from you. It's not very nice. Put it this way though. A couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, it was Easter. And um, I don't know how you all did Easter in your house, but in my house growing up, oh, that's delicious. In my house growing up, my parents, you know, when I was a young child, they would go ahead and just, Hired a big old chocolate bunny for me. These days, you know, parents are all into health and you, you might live in a household where it's like a sugar-free, gluten-free, dairy-free, fun-free, nut-free carrot bunny or something. But I grew up in a house with like just a good old chocolate bunny. That's, that's what I'm after. Hello, somebody. People are so into this I kiss sugar goodbye thing at the moment. You guys heard of that diet? I kiss sugar goodbye. It's like a famous diet. I kiss sugar. I kiss sugar goodbye as well every night. It's a long kiss. But my parents, they, you know, they would hide a chocolate. Let's just say when I was two or three years old, they'd just kind of hide it out there. And there was great joy. In the morning when I woke up, they would, they, it would begin to go for the hunt to find the big chocolate that they'd, that they'd gotten for me. And there I was, a little child running around, and they would guide me. Colder, colder, warmer, warmer, hot, boiling hot. And, and then when I found the chocolate bunny, all oh, the joy that was there as I began to gorge my face and eat it all in one go and just fat children. And I had a nickname growing up that was four by four. I sure did love my chocolate. I was just, there I was. Kind of stretched out in the end, thank God. But there was great joy in searching that out. No one scolds the child for being stupid. I mean, there it is. 
is out in the open. But no one thinks the kid is dumb because they don't realise that. We just understand the kid is young. As the children begin to get older and older, all of a sudden dad's up late at night throwing a harness on and rappelling up to the roof to hide it up there in the rafters where the 15-year-old son will never possibly find it. Maybe next Easter. And, and in the morning when the child wakes up, all of a sudden it's not as easy as when you were two years old. Now you're 15. You can just spend a couple of hours looking for yourself for the great reward. But the place where your parents would hide it was determined by the maturity of the child. Think of it in the same way. When God is getting ready to hide things, He's not hiding great things from you. He's hiding great things for you. Because there is great joy in the searching out of what God has concealed for us. There is great joy in finding out the mercies that He has new for us every morning. Did you know that when you walked in here this morning, God had gifts for you? Some of us all walk into church, not in this church, of course, in other churches, in other parts of the world, but they walk into church like, oh, I'm back in church again. God is good. Yeah. All right. Go to the next song. I'm sick of this chorus. Yeah, God is good. All right, can we sit down already? The music's too loud. You know, we just come into church and we just do our church thing. Not here. Other churches, of course. We, we don't realise sometimes that God, when we walk in here, God had things laid out waiting for you. God had glory for you to search out. God had gifts for you to seek out. God had encounters ready for you to encounter Him this morning. We all don't know some of the miracles that He had for us today. Some of you have got to realise there's still some things that God wants to do in your heart, even in the few minutes we have left. Somebody say partnership. partnership. See, how do we live in this partnership God has for us? God needs to be, we, He's inviting us into partnership with Him for all of our day, every part of our day, every part of our existence. It means at work, partnering with Him. It's not just the people who work for the church that partner with God. God wants to partner with you in every part of your work. No matter what your vocation is. You got to, I heard a quote once from one of the great Christian preachers and authors. Charles Spurgeon said it like this. He said, when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. You see, God wants to be a part of your everyday. And it's so simple, but I think so often that we can ask God to bless what we're doing rather than to stay on board with what He wants to do in and through our life. It can be so easy for us to take over the partnership at times. You see, we get busy sometimes, we take over the partnership. We feel like things are falling apart, we take over the partnership. We prayed to God for an answer, but we're not seeing the answer. So we take over the partnership. Sometimes it can be so easy to take over this partnership when we come in here for an infilling. We have a moment with God, an encounter with God, but we walk out there and, and, and we can, when life circumstances are demanding our attention, all of a sudden it can be natural to just take over the partnership. I don't know about you, friend. I don't want a natural life. I don't want natural results. I don't want natural things happening in my life. Everyone out there has enough natural going on for them. I want to live with the supernatural power of God. I want to live with the miracles that He has stored up waiting for me. Sometimes things just don't go the way we think they should go. Sometimes things don't pan out the way we think they would pan out. And we can carry disappointment from delay or distractions that we go through in life. I don't know, has anyone here ever had things not go the way they thought they would go? Remember when our church was first starting, one of my jobs was as a music teacher at our church. And because I wanted to eat a few more things than just two minute noodles every meal, I got myself another job, an extra job. Thank God for two minute noodles though. My extra job was I was the janitor of our church office. So after church on a Sunday, I would drive to the office and clean the office for three or four hours and get ready for another week of church growth and volunteers coming in and staff members coming in and God doing wonderful things. And the church was growing. And after about 12 or 18 months, we actually outgrew the office as we started it. It was awesome. So we began to move everything down to this new building we found and just a couple of miles away. We packed up the youth office, moved it down, packed up the music office, moved it down. We got it all down there. And I remember it was a Thursday afternoon about three o'clock and I got a call from our office manager. He said, hello, Rudy. I said, hello, office manager. He said, we're moving offices. I said, I know. It's awesome. He goes, you know how you're the office janitor? I said, yes, I know that. He goes, well, we need to get the carpet steam clean before we hand the keys back. I said, wonderful. 
He said, that's 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. I said, right. It's three o'clock in the afternoon now. He said, yes, that's correct. I said, thank you so much for the notice. I hung up the phone. He's not our office manager anymore. <laughs> exactly. My afternoon was booked out, packed out. I was running a small group with young people that night and I wasn't free until about 10 o'clock in the evening. And so I knew I had to get these carpets steam clean. And so I drove to the supermarket. You know, at the front of the supermarket, how they got those ratty old steam cleaners at the front. Yeah, hello, somebody. We all have been there before. And, uh, and so I went there to hire a steam cleaner. But while I was there, because, you know, thank God I was a smart individual, I had a plan. So while I was there, I got some snacks and some drinks. I knew it would be some hours I'd be busy steam cleaning these offices. But because I was smart, thank God, I bought a towel because at our offices was a shower. And I thought, what could be better in this moment? I knew I was going to have a long, sweaty night ahead of me, steam cleaning these carpets. I thought, what could be better than having a shower at the end, getting in my car, driving home, sliding straight into bed? That's a plan. So I bought it all, I loaded it into the trunk of my car, drove to the office, loaded it all up onto the second level, had it all set out, my snacks, my drinks, my towel, the machine, good to go. It was about 12 o'clock when I finally switched the machine on and there we were just, you know, it's cheap machines, they just kind of shake your arms off, just, there I was going up and down, about half an hour I'd cleaned a section about this big it felt like this particular steam machine I, I chose to get from the supermarket it was busy steam cleaning the carpet under there doing what it does but for some reason it decided to also spray water up the back while I was going along delicious <laughs> because I'm a smart individual which I've mentioned a few times I decided I got a plan here I walked over to the blinds closed the blinds on the windows walked back over to the steam machine Took my pants off, <laughs> kept going. There I was at one o'clock in the morning, just in my tidy whities just up and down. I figured it was a lot easier to brush my legs off than to ruin a pair of good jeans. And so there I was in my tidy whities just going up and down and this water's coming up and slowly those tidy whities are turning into wet brownies and just kept going, one o'clock, two o'clock, three, clean the whole office. Didn't skip a corner. I wanted to leave that place better than we found it. I wanted to leave a great impression of the church. So I cleaned every corner of that carpet. About 3.30 in the morning, I finally finished everything. Packed it all up. The drinks were gone. Snacks were gone. I thanked God I was a smart individual. Grabbed my towel. Walked down the hallway. Had one of the most glorious showers of my entire life. Got out of that shower, wrapped my towel around me and I walked back to the door of the office to pin my number into the pin pad so the door would open. Where there was a pin pad, there was now a hole. I guess they all decided they needed the pin pad down at the new offices. So I had a pin number, but no pin pad. I had a closed door, but no keys. No phone. No pants. So there all was at four o'clock in the morning, locked out of the offices with no pants on. No phone, no nothing. Now in any other suburb of Melbourne, this would not have been a big issue. I would have run down the street with my shiny legs just out there for everyone to see, but there would have been no one around. It's four o'clock in the morning. But in the particular suburb where we were, let me describe it to you. It looks a little bit like this. Dumpling shop, noodle shop, dumpling shop, noodle shop, Hong Kong dessert bar. And then it all starts again. It's like Asia Central where we are. We've got a very large Asian population in Melbourne. Now, the way I was raised in my little old home in Australia is, is that my mother taught me at four o'clock in the morning, what you do is you sleep. But for some reason, all of my Asian friends have a different idea of what is appropriate at four o'clock in the morning. They all decide that that is the best time to go out for supper. Where else to go than to a place with a dumpling shop, noodle shop, dumpling shop, noodle shop and a Hong Kong dessert bar. And so at four o'clock in the morning in any other part of Melbourne, there would have been not a person around. But at four o'clock in the morning in Box Hill, it was like rush hour on the A1A. There were cars everywhere. There were my Asian friends in those cheap old cars with the big loud music, just kind of driving up and down. There they were. And there was I with my shiny legs running up the road, trying to find a phone box with everyone around because I had no pants on. That was a night. 
where things did not really go to plan for me. But if I can leave you with one thing for today and for everyone taking notes, write this down. In 2016, when things don't go to plan, at least keep your pants on. You get that for free. You can take that home with you today. You see, when we're in partnership with God, things may not always look good to us in the natural, but these are the moments we need to trust God the most. And there are three stories I just really quickly want to share with you from the Bible. Three men of God in the Bible who were in partnership with God. It didn't always look good to them, but I want to show you how it all panned out. Can we go deeper for a moment, church? Can we go deeper for a moment? Take the man of God, Daniel, as an example. This is the man who would rather spend a night with the lions than to miss a moment in prayer. And here was Daniel, a guy who prayed every day. And it says in this particular story, he prayed every day. But in this particular story, he was praying for 21 days by the river and he did not hear God once. You all ever prayed and not felt like you heard God? Here he was, someone who knew how to pray, didn't hear God for three weeks, just praying nonstop. But it says this in Daniel chapter 10, an angel appeared to Daniel after three weeks and says, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray and to humble yourself before God, your request was heard in heaven. On the first day it was heard in in heaven, excuse me. The angel says, I've come as an answer to your prayer. And then he explains why, why the delay. He says, for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. But then Michael, one of the archangels came to help me. And I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now I am here as an answer to your prayer. Daniel started praying and God heard his request. God sent the answer on the first day. Daniel didn't get the answer until the 21st day. How often do we pray and feel like we're not hearing God? You gotta understand this church, when you pray, God hears you. When you pray, God has an answer for you. You may not have seen it yet, but the answer's on the way. You may not have the miracle you're believing God for yet, but God has sent the answer. The miracle is on the way. Some of y'all are praying for healing in your bodies. I wanna tell you, God's power is about to get ready to move in your life. You may not have seen a shift or a change yet, but God is here to heal you today. Come on, somebody shout a good praise to God right now. Don't go to sleep on me, church. You see, understand when we pray, Daniel was there praying for three weeks. When we pray, sometimes we're going to pray things through. We don't petition God to convince Him to be good. God is good all the time. Sometimes just in the petitioning of heaven, something happens to our faith and our heart. And just because we can't see the breakthrough yet, doesn't mean God hasn't sent the answer. Another story, a man of God in the Bible, his name's Isaac in the book of Genesis. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that same man. Isaac was a farmer. He was a businessman. And the story goes in Genesis chapter 26 that there was a famine in the land where Isaac was living. So because he was smart, because he knew there was a famine there, but he was a farmer, he wanted to go somewhere where his crop would work. He wanted to go to where the grass was greener. And so the Bible says, Genesis 26 verse 1, Now there was a famine in the land, and Isaac went to the king of the Philistines. But the Lord appeared to Isaac and says, Do not go down there. Live in the land where I tell you to live. God was saying to Isaac, I've placed you here. I've planted you here. You could read it like this. For such a time as this, I've called you here. It may not look good to you in the natural, but I've called you here, man of God. You stay where I put you. And so Isaac stayed. Check this out, Genesis 26, going down to verse 12. It says this, Isaac planted crops in that land. In which land? In the land which was in famine. But it was the land God had called him to. Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year he reaped 100 fold because the Lord blessed him. He reaped a hundred fold. Any business people in here would love to have a hundred fold blessing on their business. Any people with savings in the bank account that would love a hundred fold return. I don't know if you'll understand what a hundred fold return is. We put our money in the bank, we get 3% back. That's lovely. We invest in a business, we get 20% back. That's a miracle. But God doesn't, if you read the Bible, God never, God, God never speaks in fractions. 
God's always talking in multiples. Some of you all in here got to get ready to believe God for multiples, not for fractions anymore. You see, it's like putting a dollar in the bank and getting a hundred back. That's a good bank. It's like putting a hundred dollars in the bank and getting 10,000 back. That's a wonderful bank. That's the kind of bank I'd want to put my money in. It's like putting $10,000 in the bank and getting a million back. That's what a hundredfold return is. Some of you all got to begin to believe God for a multiplication to come upon your business, for a multiplication to come upon your investments. We all have got an opportunity to begin to partner with God. Pastor Robin was up here before telling us about this Pentecost offering. What an opportunity to partner with God, to invest alongside God. That's the kind of partner I want to invest with, the partner who gives returns in multiples. One more story. Can I share one more story? There's a man named Stephen in the Bible. Stephen wasn't important. He wasn't a politician like Daniel. He wasn't a businessman like Isaac. He wasn't a preacher or a man of God. Stephen was simply a waiter. Nothing important. All he had was a tray and his drinks. The band can come back. But Stephen believed God, that God could use him wherever he was at. He wasn't waiting for a title. He wasn't waiting for a more prestigious position. He wasn't waiting for a stage with a microphone. He wasn't waiting for an opportunity with the government. No, Stephen just believed God that God could use him wherever he was at. The Bible says this in Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Stephen was a man who worked miracles as a waiter. He wasn't a church staff member. He wasn't on the intercessory team necessarily. He wasn't a preacher. Stephen was just a waiter, but he knew that God would use him wherever he was at. Wasn't determined by his location. It wasn't determined by his vocation. It certainly wasn't determined by his paycheck. Stephen just believed God to use him wherever he was at. And so miracles come to pass. Someone in here has got to begin to believe God this morning that God wants to partner with you in every part of your life. Somebody shout partnership this morning. Come on, if you believe God, say partnership. Partnership. Imagine if Daniel had given up praying on day 20. 20 days is a long time to pray. Imagine if he'd given up on day 20 and missed the answer on the next day. Imagine if Isaac had done what made sense and gone to another land to be a farmer and missed the miracle God had for him. Imagine if Stephen had waited for God to promote him before he trusted God to use him. I don't want to be someone who partners with God only when it's on my time frame. I don't want to just trust God only when everything looks good. I don't want to be the kind of man of God that only trusts God as my partner when He does things according to my schedule. I want to be someone who trusts God no matter what it looks like, no matter how long it takes no matter what other people may say, no matter what it may look like in the natural. This is the kind of partner I want to be with God. Sometimes we can take over the partnership. But friend, when we let God take the wheel, Jesus take the wheel. When we let God have our lead partnership in life, all the miracles that He wants to bring to pass. All over this place, would you stand to your feet this morning? I believe that God is stirring people even even as I've been preaching, you know. Maybe you're a Christian, you haven't given up on God. But there's areas of your life where you know you've stopped partnering with Him. There's part of your life where maybe God didn't answer your prayers on your timeline. There's a part of your life that was falling apart so you grabbed a hold of it instead of trusting God. I believe that can happen to all of us at times. I'm not saying that you're out of relationship with God. I'm just saying, hey, God wants to partner with you every second of every moment of every day. And maybe today God is stirring you, even as I've spoken. Maybe if we could close our eyes all over this room. And if you know that God is speaking to you right now to step back into partnership with Him. Oh, you, you, you love Him. You're in relationship with Him. But there's areas of your life that you know you've slipped out of partnership with Him. And I believe that the Holy Spirit will be stirring people's hearts in this place today to say, God, 
I trust in you again. God, I stand in faith with you again. I believe, Holy Spirit, we begin to stir people's faith in this room. If that's you all over this room, if you know God's speaking to you, would you just raise your hand with eyes closed all over this room, no one moving around. Come on, would you raise your hand? By raising your hand, you're just saying, God, I choose to trust you again. I step back into partnership with you again. No matter what it looks like, no matter how long it's taken, no matter what people are saying, God, I step into partnership with you again. And God, I just pray for every person in this place right now. You see every situation. You see every need. You see every circumstance. But Father, I pray that You begin to stir faith. God, begin to open up people's eyes to the things You have in store for them in this great partnership You've called us to. Lord, begin to stir people's faith. Let them see the things You have stored up waiting for them. God, I know Your Word says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what You have in store. God, I couldn't possibly begin to describe what You have for every individual. But Lord, would You stir faith right now? Would You begin to drop visions and dreams into people's hearts? Lord, the wonderful things You have in partnership for people this morning. Oh God, stir faith right now. Stir faith in this place. Spirit.